Hello and welcome to today's episode of DRS with me, Ash. And I don't need to introduce the guest on the show today. Uh, it is a man with over 25,000 international runs and many trophies behind him. And my current coach at the Delhi Capitals. Ricky, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. Absolutely. Pleasure, mate. Looking forward to it. <laughs> I think we'll, uh, we'll re- I'm going to have a lot of fun having this conversation, Ricky. But a lot of Indians, uh, when you talk about Ricky Ponting, uh, they know he's the man who plays fearless cricket and does what his team needs once he crosses the boundary line. Uh, but for someone who's read your uh, autobiography at the close of play, it just signifies and resonates a lot more, Ricky, because uh, your upbringing in Launceston, your greyhound racing and all that, uh, I just want to go back a little bit there and ask you, what was it like? Everybody had Alan Border as their, you know, uh, an idol or something, but you had David Boone, who's the current match referee of the ICC. So, can you take us back there? Yeah, look, my, my upbringing... Um... You know, it's probably a little bit different than most. I mean, I, I grew up in, um, like, living in government housing. I'm not sure if that really means much to you, but my parents, uh, we never owned our own home. Um, so we're always sort of moving around from suburb to suburb. And, um, you know, we never had a lot of uh, dispensable income, if you like. So, um, you know, things were never easy. Um, but it was what it was. You know, I grew up in a, in a very much, you know, loving family, a very much a sports-loving family. My dad was a, a highly talented sportsman in, you know, cricket, Aussie rules, football and golf. And my mum played her fair share of sport as well. So, um, yeah, and then the greyhound racing thing. I mean, growing, I sort of grew up with greyhounds around me. My dad and my grandfather trained racing greyhounds. So there's photos of me as a, as a one-year-old laying on blankets in the backyard with these racing dogs all around me. So um, I sort of grew up with that. And then when I, when I started playing first-class cricket and started to make – a little bit of money. Um, I purchased my first greyhound and had a bit of fun, a bit of success with that. And then it's just something that's been a, a huge part of my life sort of ever since to the stage now where I'm, you know, I actually breed my own now um, oh. with the help of a few other trainers, obviously to point me in the right direction, but it's just been a, you know, it was a really good passion of mine and something that I had that was outside of cricket. You know what it's like when you, when you're so caught up in international cricket and, and you go back to your state, you just don't, it's really easy to get, caught up and have nothing, nothing else to think about. So I, it was important for me to have greyhound racing and golf and, and other things like that to keep me busy outside of international cricket. At some stage while I was reading the book, I was afraid that Ricky Ponting would just sway away from playing cricket and just play golf. Is that a feeling you had when you were young as well? Or did you like golf a little bit more than cricket? Uh, look, I think there were probably two other sports that I played as a young bloke. One was Aussie rules football and the other one was golf. And um, there's no doubt that I actually enjoyed playing Aussie rules football more. I'm not sure if you've ever seen the game ever, but it's a, it's, a, it's almost like the ultimate team game. You know, it's a, a really I find team. it more, I find it more entertaining than rugby actually, to be honest, because it's far more quicker, I guess. So. Yeah. And being a 360 degree game as well, like rugby is very much, you know, one dimensional and whereas Aussie rules football is 360 degrees. So um, look, I love playing that game. I love playing golf, golf, sort of came to me a bit, little bit later as well. Golf, so I took up golf in maybe my early teens. Um, so then it was probably too late to even think about choosing a profession with it. But um, I think I sit back now, having played whatever it was, 15 years of international cricket, and I think I made the right decision. Right. I mean, clearly, I mean, someone like me is completely inspired with the way you played your cricket. And I hear a lot about uh, working with you as a coach from a lot of players down there at Mumbai Indians and now at Delhi Capitals. I'm so looking forward to you know, this journey with you. But having said that, that, that can wait. But uh, my question is around your greyhound racing. In India, we have a lot of dog shows. Uh, people train the dogs to, you know, listen to their master, put on a show, yeah. and, you know, win that. What exactly is greyhound racing? If uh, some of the Indians might resonate with it. How do you go about we, it? Basically, you're trying to make them run as fast as you, as you can. They basically run around a, a circle or a, or a U-turn track, a U-shaped track. Um, they start out of boxes, so they're all put into like uh, boxes, and the and the lids fly on the front of the boxes, and the, the dogs come out and actually chase a, a fake lure. So it's like a it's like a fake rabbit. So if you if you if you go back a couple of hundred years in history, um, and you think back to the days in you know in the UK and to England, the greyhound racing used to be actual greyhounds chasing live rabbits around big open paddocks, yeah. and the fastest greyhound to catch the rabbit first was the one that got the prize. So this is sort of a more of a, I guess, a modernised version of hundreds of years ago. Um, obviously, with a, with a fake rabbit, a fake lure. So, they chase that. Obviously, the first one across the line is the winner. So, it's like horse racing, I guess, but they're, right, they're actually wonderful. chasing. I something. hope the hound racing becomes a thing in India. There are a few hounds here as well. But having said that, Ricky, 
Uh, how did you manage to land up with the name Punter? Is that because of Greyhound Racing or uh, something more? Yeah, pretty much. Um, look, I went to the, I left um, home, left Launceston at the age of 15, went across to Adelaide to the Cricket Academy, um, which to this day was one of the best things that's probably ever happened. It, you know, going to a, a place where you're training twice a day, six days a week with guys that were five or six years older than me at the time, it, it just really sped up all my learning processes about the game. Um, the first year I was there, Shane Warne came over to have a, a couple of months of training with us before he went on his first Australian tour to Sri Lanka. And, um, yeah, I was, as I said, I was only a young bloke, 15 or 16, but I was, I was sneaking down to the local pubs and, and having a few bets on the dogs back in Tasmania. And, and because of the name Ponting and then warning you I was having a, a bet, which in Australia is called a punt, um, that's where the nickname Punter came from. So it's been with me for 30 years now. And I think people know, probably know me more now as Punter than they do as actually Ricky. So it's, it's one that stuck. It'll take me longer to call you Punter. I'm just going to stick to Ricky for a while. But anyway, having said that, Ricky... Uh, there, are, uh, there are certain things I would like to ask, but the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, most Australians pull well and you're exceptional at it, right? So for me, watching the game and you wearing the cap and pulling Shoei Bakhtar still sticks out a lot. Uh, how did that happen? It must have happened from a very young age, right? There must be a formative thing for that. How did that happen? Yeah, well, I think it's the, the exact opposite to young Indian players growing up being great players of spin. Um, you know, where I grew up, and as I said, a bit about my background, like... I didn't play on turf wickets until I was 15, 16 years of age, really. Um, so all my junior cricket was played on um, AstroTurf, concrete with fake grass on top. And we all, we all know how much the ball bounces off that type of surface. And, you know, because I was, I was, I was always the youngest player in each team. So if I, got, if I went to club training, because I had, you know, my fair share of natural ability, I, I'd be a 12 or 13 year old, but I'd be batting in the A grade net. So I had all the, some of the fastest bowlers in the state running in bowling, bowling to this cocky little 12 year old. And all they were trying to do was knock my head off. So I had to try and find a way to survive and combat it. And um, so because I was short playing on bouncy wickets, the ball was always sort of above chest high to, to me. And I think right. that's where the, the shot was just ingrained into me at, a, at an early age. Right. But I mean, uh, lots, lots of things have changed since uh, we had a, you know, a very uh, traumatic, a traumatic incident with Phil Hughes much later on. But someone like you wearing a cap in an international match and hooking Shoy Bakta was going at 150 clicks and plus. Uh, what was that about? Was it very instinctive? Was it a young and cocky bloke doing it? Would you recommend that to anyone else now that you're a coach? Yeah, uh, no, I don't recommend it anymore. No, absolutely not. And I look back now, I mean, I don't think it was being cocky, but if you think back to when I started, you know, I started playing state cricket in the you know, the early to mid nineties, helmets weren't that prevalent back then, really. A lot of guys actually weren't wearing helmets. And certainly as a, as a junior, when you were growing up, you, no one had a helmet. So it, it just it was really unusual to, to wear a helmet. I actually started, the first time I ever wore a helmet was just with right. the plastic ear guards, like a la Chris uh, Bickham. The, the, the used to use it without the uh, waist. Yeah, exactly like that. Yeah, and that so that was the first one I used, and then and, and when I put first put the bars on, it was like I got all this stuff in my eyes. I can't see properly. It was really, it was really foreign. But so it was never about being cocky. It was um it was just um, how I was brought up. And I think now, it, like if if I was, it's amazing to me now how many more guys get hit in the head than they did twenty years ago. And I think that's because as a junior, everyone's wearing a helmet, so you don't actually have any fear of getting hit. So guys are getting hit now and really not getting hurt that badly. Whereas back when, when I started, or even just before I started, if you got hit, it was pretty, you know, it could be a pretty nasty injury. So, um, yeah, I think that's some of the reasons why. But look, I wasn't trying to, I uh, wasn't trying to prove a point, or it was. I just felt more comfortable in a cap, and I'd done it my whole life. Right. This, this, I think, some of the Indians might be able to resonate with uh, Ricky. You, I, I read in your book that David Boone was one of your big you know, inspirations or some, some sort of, you know, role model to follow because he was also from Tasmania, from your small town of sorts. So as a young kid who was, you know, who was uh, looking up to David Boone, did you get a chance to meet him through your, uh, you know, days that you were coming up? No, I never got a chance to meet him until I was actually in the state squad for the first time. Um, you know, we, as you say, we both grew up in Launceston. Um, his upbringing was a little bit different than mine. He was a okay. private school kid that lived in the, the, the other suburbs than where I, than where I lived, but... Um, no, and because, you know, he was always on the road. We know what international cricket's like. Um, so to have a chance to try and meet him was, was next to zero. But 
Um, you know, and the reason I did idolise him was from Launceston, top order batsman, um, and whatever whatever he was doing in his life was what I wanted to do. You know, that was I just so dearly wanted to play for Tasmania, wanted to be good enough to play for Australia, and he was someone that if I thought if I followed and idolised him, there's you know there was no reason why I couldn't do it either. So. Um, you know, I ended up playing, I think, 106, 107 test matches and, and played in the old-fashioned Australian way, I guess. So he was, right, he was definitely someone. Now moving on to a lot more uh, entertaining stuff that I have been privy to watching very closely. Uh, is your start of your career, right? When you started off your career, you were, again, this really you know, flamboyant sort of a player who took the battle on, battled at three, maybe a little lower when you started off your career. You had some interesting duels with some great off-spin bowlers, right? I'm sitting right in front of you and you played against Graham Swan, Harbhajan Singh, Murli Dharan. And can you talk us through a bit about your, uh, uh, between your duels between these uh, great off-spinners? Yeah, look, I had, well, Harbhajan's the obvious one. I mean, I had some unbelievable battles with him and, and probably more often than not, he had the, be- he had the better of me, certainly in, in test cricket. I mean, I think he's probably got me out as many times as anybody in, in test match cricket. I remember there was one series here in maybe... 2001. 2001. No, it wasn't 2001. It must have been before that. Uh, 2001, was it? Yeah. I, I think he got me out five times. Every time I batted in the series. And um, yeah, it was almost like he, he had some sort of spell over me every time I walked out to bat in test cricket. So, and the, when I look back now with that, um, you know, as I said, growing up in Tasmania, playing on hard wickets my whole career, right. hardly facing any spin bowling at all, really, until you got to the top level. Uh, and then when you get to the top level and you play in Australia, as you know, you've been there, you don't really get much out of the wickets. So as a batsman, you don't really have a lot of fear about playing spin bowling on Australian wickets. But coming here to India, um, I remember the first test, I think, was in Chennai of that series. Uh, the first innings of that game, I just, I, I got, and I, I made runs in the tour. Mumbai, game. Mumbai, Calcutta and Chennai was the last one. Oh, I don't know, sorry, right. Yeah, Mumbai was the first one. Yeah, Mumbai was the first one. Um, and I got runs in the tour game as well. I think I got 80 or 90, maybe even 100 in the tour game. So I felt really good coming into the game and go out to bat and just sort of push forward to one, got an inside edge onto the pad, caught it short leg. And, I, and I'm walking off thinking, God, I haven't done much wrong there and I'm, and I'm out, you know. So, and then from that moment on, it was, I didn't trust my technique. So I was trying to find a different way to play. Next innings, I ran down the wicket first ball and got stumped. Oh, yeah. uh, I then tried to sweep, got a bottom edge on the first one, popped up the short leg. Um, and that was just all on the back of not having enough experience or enough skill, if you like, to to um, combat Indian conditions. And against Harbhajan, probably then, that's probably the best series that he, he probably ever had in his career. I think he took 30-odd wickets in, in three. He had a 10 for every game. Yeah, like every year. So there you go. So uh, he was on top of his game. I wasn't. Um, and that was probably the start of him having a, a really good run against me. So, um, yeah, Murali was a little bit different. I, funnily enough... Um, if you look back and if you asked anybody around the world who was the harder bowler to face out of Harbhajan and Murali, probably everybody would have said Murali. But I actually did really well against Murali. Murali never got me out that often anyway. So, um, yeah, so it, I don't know. It was just uh, that, that one series, I think, gave Harbhajan a lot of confidence and probably took a little bit of my confidence away against him. <laughs> But what, what, what really, as, as a captain, as someone who understands technique a lot, and you do, you do a lot of work around it now as a coach as well. So what do you think was the difference between the three offices, Swan, Arbhajan, and Murli? Uh, they were all contrasting bowlers, weren't they? Yeah, d- definitely. Um, you know, you think about Graham Swan, the first thing you think about is the, is the great shape out of his hand. Like a lot of drift away. A lot of drift sort of tries to start the ball down the line of the stumps, drift it out and catch the edge of the foot mark and spin it back. Um, Harbhajan was the other way, he was more over the top and if anything, actually got the ball to d- almost feel like it was drifting into you and continually drifting on the angle um, and Murali, or because of his angle he couldn't, he couldn't drift the ball, he just got all sorts of overspin and, and doozeries and that sort of stuff, so they were all contrasting, there's no doubt about it and that's the beauty of, that's the beauty of our game at test level, that you know, everyone's different, and then you come along with your skills that you can do what you do and then bowl a leg spinner in, in on top of that as well, so um, look, the, the evolution, I think, of the evolution of off-spin bowling has been quite dramatic. From You think back, you know, before Murali started, certainly Sackley and Mushtaq, you know, coming in and bowling, starting that, that doozer that he started. You know, the skills now of, of off-spin bowling is, is vastly different than it was 20 years ago. Okay, let, let me understand this a little bit more, Ricky. As a bowler, I've always felt this, but I wanted to understand. I watched a lot of cricket when I was young on TV, most literally. Uh, but as a batter who grew up and played 
the games at different stages. In fact, you did uh, give your hand at T20 cricket at the World Cup as well. How much have these wickets changed, Ricky? The quality of these pitches have they changed much at all along with these bats, or are they pretty much the same? Um, no, well, you'd like to think just because of probably more money in the game now than ever, um, probably more emphasis placed on on wickets. Um, certainly, in, certainly in one day cricket and and T20 cricket, the, the, the surfaces now are unbelievably good. I mean, they, they just are very, very good. And, and even with that, I think that's also, I think, a bit of the beauty of the IPL tournament in itself is that from venue to venue, everywhere you go, the wickets are just that little bit different. You know, they're slightly different. So it's not about bat dominating ball all the time, um, which it can. But I think in one day international cricket now around the world, it's very rare that you see a, a pitch that offers anything for a fast bowler or a spinner. So... Um, I think the wickets probably have got that little bit better. There's no doubt that the bats are a lot better than they than they were. Um, even probably to the, 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 the how many bats that batsmen go through these days to make sure they've got six absolutely perfect bats in their kit. I mean, yeah. So I mean, it, when I was when I was first starting, if you ha- you you'd generally have one really good bat, and the other ones that were just you were just hoping that your good one didn't break because you didn't want to use the other ones. So. Um, but look, lots of things have changed, and it's been all I think all been for the betterment of the game because I think it's made. Well, you'll be a good one to ask. If you just have to keep evolving your skills, knowing that the batsmen have probably got an advantage because of the, the bats they're using and the wickets they're playing on. Sometimes I, I as a bowler, just feel that uh, people stay in the past uh, is in terms of saying how much a person explores or uh, you know exercises right of creativity in this game because uh, the game's moved so fast because uh, I started playing the IPL in 20, uh, 2008 and it's been 12 years on the road and I, I, I can't even begin to tell how much the game has come through and the modern challenges of the game is that you constantly need to bring something new to the table. So yep. speak, speaking of which, Ricky, bringing new things to the table, from a batter, were you always a leader along your you know uh, childhood age group category of cricket? Under 19 in Australia, were you always a leader or just a batter who you know went about his business? Um, no, I wasn't always a leader because if I think back to junior cricket, um, I was generally the youngest player in every team that I played in. So if, you know, if it was an under 17 team, you know, I was 13. If it was an under 19 team, I was 16 or 17. So those leadership roles at junior level, I mean, I, I captained school teams because there was no real age restriction on the on the school teams. But when I started getting into age group cricket and certainly into grade cricket. You know, I start with Tasmania as a 17 year old. Um, those leadership roles didn't really come, come around at all until just before um, I was made Australian captain. I captained Tasmania in the, the season before, in 2003, before I came the, became the Australian captain. And that was really the first time I'd, that I'd led a men's team. But the important thing for me was, and I've said this forever, that even though I wasn't a captain, because I felt with the talent that I had, I could see the game in a, in a pretty clear way anyway, even as a young bloke. And so I was always thinking on the field like a captain would think. And I think by the time I, by the time I took over a leadership role or a captaincy role, I actually felt like I was in, I had a pretty good grasp and understanding of the game. That's fair because most of the leaders of uh, international teams have had a pathway of being leaders through the age group category. And then they go on to become leaders. And one of the exceptions is Mahendra Singh Dhoni. He wasn't a leader at different stages, but he went on to be one of the greatest. And when you're talking about greatest captains, I can't leave you behind with some of the greatest achievements under your belt. What would, you, what would be your greatest achievement, Ricky? Despite a lot of those things that uh, I think will take a lot of beating by the captains in the future, what would you call as your biggest achievement? As a captain? Yeah, uh, as a player, as a captain, anything. Yeah, I think, look, as a player, I, I think my longevity is probably the thing that I'm, I'm most proud of. Like, as a an international player to be able to maintain a level over 168 test matches that's good enough to, to you know, be one of your best players in your country or one of the best players in the world over such a long period of time. I think um, that's what I'm really proud of. I think, you know, the other thing is how many test wins I was involved in. I think I played 168. I think I, think I was a, played in a winning team 109 or 110 times. Yeah, 70% wins, yeah. Yeah, as a, as a player. Um, so, yeah, you've got to be proud of those things. I mean, the hundreds are great. The runs are great. All things, all those things are great. But it re- I played the game to win. And it was all about winning and trying to trying to give my team and my teammates the best chance of winning every game that we played. So, um, you know, those things. But if you look back at, as a, at a captaincy thing, I think 
16 straight test match wins is a, a pretty remarkable thing to achieve. Um, and that obviously happened under Steve Waugh's captaincy and then ha- happened under my captaincy a few years later. Um, and then you, go, you look back at World Cups and things like that, whereas you know, we, the, I played in three winning World Cups, which I was very lucky to do and captain two of those. And the, the two that I captained, we didn't lose a single game through the whole campaign. So those things, when you look back at your career, and you, it's, it's only ever when you finish, you look back on those things as well. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure how much you think back to series up whether you've played or whatever, but it's not until you finish you think you look back and think about how lucky you were to play when when we did. Yeah, I mean, obviously, too, you don't have enough time to think on the road because you're looking to constantly evolve and improve. It's a different uh, ball game altogether. Sometimes when people do ask me this question, I'm always dumb on for answers. Uh, but Ricky, when you speak about captaincy, there are two series that sticks out for me, Ricky. There have been several memorable tournaments for you where you completely, you know, dominated the series. But the 2005 Ashes Test Series, right? Um, by far, I think that's had the most impact. Like you have, uh, you have the impactful series that you watch. I'm playing club cricket and I'm following the series and I say, you know, if ever I want to be a test cricket, I want to be involved in a series like that. How was, how was that feeling? Yes, I know you, it didn't go on the right way for you guys, but how was it? How was it going through that whole series? Um, look, look, I'm on record to say that that's the best test series I think I ever played in. Um, and it was probably one of the most significant test series for the world game. I think test match cricket around that stage was just starting to be a little bit predictable, if you like. You know, we'd had a really, a really strong run for a long time and we'd won the Ashes a few times in a row and whatever else. Um, and I, but that every ball that was bowled through that entire five test match series was, was what the game is all about, you know. And I, I go, I'll go back to the first session at Lords um, day one. You know, we won the toss, we were batting, and they just came from everywhere at us. You know, Harmison was bowling like the wind. You know, he hit me, he split my open on my cheek. He hit Justin, he hit Matty Hayden, I think. Um, and it was just on. I mean, not in a bad way. It was just the hardest cricket that you will ever play. It was just, you know, 20, 22 grown men that were just out there not willing to give an inch and playing for their, for their countries. And it was, you know, and it just seemed to grow from there. It was just a remarkable series. I'll never forget the... Day five, heading to Manchester, and we we had to bat out the last, I think the last four sessions of that game to try and hang on for a draw. We're chasing 520 or something in the last innings, and they sent us in late on day four. I think we were one down overnight. And trying to go to the ground the next day in Manchester in, the, in a team bus, you couldn't get the bus down any of the streets. Every street every laneway, anywhere you try to go. I think we took about four or five different routes, just wanting to get to the ground to witness that last day's play. It was incredible. So those, you know, you, you walk away, even though we lost the series, we held on that day, thankfully, we lost that series, but you come away with so many unbelievably good memories. Right. I mean, on, on a lighter note, if not on a cheeky note, did England use jelly beans to reverse the ball? <laughs> I don't know what they were using, but it certainly reversed a lot. <laughs> right, because see, anybody involved in that series, whenever I see them, this is the first thing that fascinates me. I end up asking questions. And one of those people I asked questions about was uh, Duncan Fletcher, the then coach of the English team. Uh, I spoke to him. I, I'm going to narrate that incident a little later, but tell me something. You had this incident where you got ran out by a, a substitute fielder and walking across the Trent Bridge. I, I played for Trent, uh, not even last year. And I was just sitting in the dressing room saying, this is exactly where Duncan was sitting. And Ricky had a go at it. What was all, the, all that about? Ricky? Well, the lead, up, the lead up to the run out was, you know, we've been, obviously, as you do for every Ashes series, we've been keeping a pretty close eye on England, the way they've been playing. And, you know, and it was really apparent to us the way they'd been using their fast bowlers and then their substitute fielders. Like, you know, their, their quicks would bowl at over spell. They'd immediately go off the ground for 20 or 30 minutes. The subs would come on and, and so in the lead up to the first test, I actually said to the match referee, can we just, I understand if they're going to go off, but can we just keep an eye on it to make sure that they haven't got the subs on for long periods of time? Anyway, so just build up and build up and build up. And, and at that stage of that game, we were just clawing our way back into the, game, into the game. Damian Martin and I were probably 40 odd, not out each. And we were trying to set a total and then try and bowl them out. And yeah, Marto pushes one in on the offside and I take off for a single and Gary Pratt runs around and, throws the stumps down from cover point and I was a few inches short. So on the way off the ground, I could see Duncan had walked, made his way to the edge of the barrack and he had this big smile on his face as if to say, yes, this, this, this plan's come together perfectly. We've run out the Aussie captain. And um, I may mention the other day, actually, about, about Mahendra um, Singh Dhoni and how it, 
when he was captain, he never seemed to let his emotions get the better of him. And as I was walking off the field that day, I think it was pretty fair to say that I let my emotions get the better of me. So <laughs> I had a few choice words for Duncan through the members, which wasn't ideal. Um, and the second part of that story, actually, so I go back with Australia um, as assistant coach for the World Cup. And we get to, we get to, um, we get to Trent Bridge. And I'm walking up the stairs and go into the ouch. He said, oh, the last time I saw you here, I had to go up and drag you out of the England dressing rooms because you're going up to see Duncan <laughs> Fletcher. So um, he remembered me. Right, wonderful story. The man that Duncan is, I asked him uh, how, how was the series and he told me that he had this weird plan where every time Matty Hayden walked out to bat, you know, uh, Matty always skipped the English flag. You know, the, the boys who were holding the flag up, the English flag at the start of the, at the, start of the you know, balcony. Yeah, and Matty yeah. always skipped it and moved across. He moved left way and went the other way. So he said he put those boys holding the English flag right up to the balcony so he couldn't move out. And when, and when Matty tried to move out, he actually slipped. And uh, Duncan was like, I was all smiles. I said, coach, you're extremely mean. You're not supposed to be doing that. <laughs> and it's, that that's how much an Ashes win means to uh, an England, England fan, an England cricketer or an Aussie cricketer, right? But having said that, what do you think Duncan was about? Was he playing mind games with you guys? Oh, I mean, that, that has to be mind games, doesn't it? I mean, I think the fact that, the, the fact that I'd probably brought it up in the the substitute fielder thing, the fact that I brought that up in the referees meeting before the first test, I mean, he's sitting in there, right? So if he's trying to play mind games, they would have been trying to get as many subs onto the field right the way through because they, they would have known that it would have been annoying me. So um, look, who knows? At the end of the day, um, we, we went there as the favourites with a very, very good team. We knew we were coming up against a very good English team uh, that were well-led, that were well-skilled. And I don't know Duncan that well, but it, obviously well-coached. Um, and, yeah, we, we just weren't quite good enough. A couple of critical mistakes that we made and a few things here and there um, meant that we didn't win. But as I said, it was just a magnificent series to be a part right. of. Right. Ricky, now I'm going to uh, get to another very important series that I watched. In 2007 and 8, India toured Australia. There was this whole fiasco around what happened in Australia. I'm not going to get there. But there are two sides to the story. I asked Anil about it. Uh, how was it like being on the Australian side of the fence? Uh, with, with India, you know, wanting to pull out and all that drama unfolding. What was it to be on the other side of the fence being the captain of that side? Yeah, look, it was obviously a very dif uh, difficult, I guess, delicate situation as well. I mean, but yeah, you have to understand that if I'm going to... I had to back up Andrew Simons and what had been said. And as captain, you know, as you know, what we are constantly told and reminded that this racial vilification stuff, if it ever happens or it's ever heard on the field, it just has to be reported, right? So, so it had happened on the field. I went to the umpire straight away, um, let them know, and then there was a meeting that night, and it just sort of grew from there. You know, it, it, it grew quickly, and it yeah, grew... Escalated. It turned into, obviously, a huge, yeah, a huge issue between not just the... not, And it wasn't really an issue between the two teams, to be honest, because it got to board level so quickly that, you know, it was... And, yeah, but... I mean, at the end of that test, we're sitting, we're sitting in a, um, you know, a high court in Adelaide, um, having the verdict handed down of what was going to happen with Harvard. And it was just, yeah, it was an amazing event of circumstances. And um, I guess one that none of us are probably, anyone that was involved in it, and, you know, I'm, a, I'm only involved in it because I was captain of the Australian team. It wasn't like there was anything directly involved with me, but... Any, anyone that was involved in it will probably look back and think that it wasn't um, a highlight of their career, let's put it that way. And, um, but I think what it's also done, I think it's, um, it's continued the really strong rivalry, I reckon, between the two countries. There's no doubt now. I mean, I, you know, an, an Ashes series now, an Indian series now, uh, I think both teams would say the same thing. It's, it's almost on an even keel. And, I mean, you put South Africa in there as well, which are obviously great rivals of ours, but I think... You know, Australia, India now. And we'll see it again this summer when, it's, when or hopefully India come out to Australia. I mean, it's just going to be, you know, two great teams, two very proud teams, two very strong leaders and two very strong groups of characters in each team. And that normally leads to, to entertaining cricket. I mean, having said that, Ricky, I need to acknowledge the fact that as a youngster and as a cricketer having played with Australia, it's only strengthened the resolve on the Indian side and made India a better cricketing nation, to be honest. But uh, Ricky, but a more relatable question for me from a captaincy perspective, uh, Ricky Ponting, the leader, uh, obviously you had a fantastic bowling attack, but I'm interested in the spin department. 
you had one of the greatest spinner ever to have played the game on your side. How did you really have to handle spin? Did you ever have to handle it? Or you never bothered to go to Shane Warne's feet too? No, no. We, Warnie and I had a great relationship. As, as I said, I've known Warnie for, well, since, yeah, for 30 years now. Um, and I played, well, I probably played, how many years did I play with him? I must have played five, six, yeah, seven years with him, I guess. Um, and he, I mean, he understood his game. He understood his skills. He understood batsmen really well. Um, and we would quite, op- quite often have pretty open uh, discussions and conversations about the way that we should go about trying to either get somebody out or stop them scoring, whatever. But, um, you know, it, I was the sort of person that as long as the bowler was really clear with what they wanted to do, at the end of the day, they're the ones that have got to try and execute it. I, it's no good me trying to come over the top and tell them, something else because they know what they're trying to do. McGraw was the same. You know, when, when you know you've got guys that are in complete control of their game, then sometimes as a captain, you can take a back seat a little bit, have a little bit of input where you can, but let them run their own show. And, and certainly with Warney, um, you just throw him the ball and stand at selling it off and wait for a catch to come your way. Yeah, because my memory is about Shane Warne just whisking a hand away and you're standing next to him having a discussion. That really sticks on top of my head. I, I used to be wondering, what are these guys actually talking? Because at the end of the conversation, Ricky goes back and stands it for a you know, silly point. So what would the conversation be about? Would it be just casual discussions about what you'd be doing in the evening or would it be serious cricket discussions on the field? <laughs> no, I never had too many discussions with Warnie about what was going to happen post-play. Oh, that, was, <laughs> that was well out of my, uh, well out of my wheelhouse. But um, no, look, I, I don't even recall him doing that. I don't recall him sort of wafting his hand or whatever. But, yeah, you, you, know, you had this habit of like, you know, showing a fly away or something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, as I said, if I give him advice when I, when I thought I needed to, but otherwise he, uh, he was pretty much in control of what he was doing. Right. Okay. Handling of spinners, Ricky, you've come over and been in the IPL for a few years now. Uh, you've also coached at different uh, places, even for Australia, you're currently a coach. How different is it to handling fast bowlers? Is spin any different or it's all the same? Um, oh, look, it's... I think it's more about the personality, really. I don't think I don't think it matters if you're a spin bowler or a fast bowler. I think, you know, the, the more you can understand the person and the more you can communicate well with the person, I think the better off you're going to be. I think the game, certainly as a coach now, um, is all about relationships you build with the players and, and, and building great trust with the with the player and, and from and from player back to coach to understand that, you know, if you ever whatever I say or whatever you say, that we know that we're trying to do the best that we can for each other as as players and trying to get the best result we can for each other and for the team. So, look, I don't, I don't think it, it matters. I mean, it's, it's, you mean, they're, they're obviously vastly different skills and there's different nuances to what, how a, a spinner is trying to work over a batsman and get, and get a batsman out than the way that a fast bowler is. But I guess if you look at, if you look at someone like a Glenn McGrath, he probably had a bit more of a, sp- a spinner's mentality, if you like, with the way that he tried to, to get batsmen out. It wasn't about running in and blasting guys out or, bowling a perfect leg cutter or bowling a perfect um, outswinger. It was about bowling good balls, building pressure, uh, you know, not bowling bad balls, that sort of thing. So I think um, that's where you have to be, I think, anyway, be a bit more flexible with the spinners, understand what they're trying to do and what they're trying to create and then put the fields in place and let them go about. And it might take them an hour, it might take them an hour and a half to get that wicket, but you've got to give them what they want and what they need to try and achieve that. An hour, hour and a half seems like a long way away. The patience levels have definitely come down these days, Ricky. But having said that, Ricky, uh, I'm going to, you're wearing the DC t-shirt and I cannot leave you without asking questions about it. What does the Delhi Capital Synergy mean to you? How was your stint last year? You qualified for the first time after a long time for DC. Uh, what does it mean to you? How do you look at the site? Yeah, look, last, last season for us, I mean, it was a brand new start, wasn't it? It was a rebranding of the franchise, Daredevils to Capitals, new ownership group came in. And it just, it, the whole thing from that moment just had a real vibrancy about it. And it was really important that me and the other coaches and the players, that we really embraced that and went along with that on that journey of being new and being exciting and being fresh. And, um, and that, was a try, that was the way that we tried to play our cricket. You know, it was about being brave and taking the game on. And, you know, we feel like we've got, you know, last year certainly had a really good squad. This year, I think we've added to the squad and made it even stronger. And, um, I said at the end of it, I was so disappointed that we didn't make it through to the final last year because I think the, the, the level of cricket that we played right the way through, I felt that we probably deserved to be in the final. But, you know, in this game, you, you, 
you get what you deserve and you deserve what you get. And unfortunately, in that last game against um, Chennai, we just weren't quite good enough. We didn't serve up our best stuff that day. And in the IPL, if you don't bring your best game each and every day, you're going to get beaten. So um, but when I spoke to the guys at the end of that game and certainly the next day, I, I had the most fun I've ever had with any team last year. And that's I'm talking about World Cup wins. I'm talking about captain in Australia. I had the most fun um, of any of any environment that I've ever been in. And that's what I'm going to create again this year. Yes, we've got, you know, a changeover of probably six or seven, eight players. That's exciting to me. Um, but, you know, I'm, I've got a very clear vision of what I want the Delhi Capitals to be and how I want us to play. And it's up to me and the rest of the coaches and more importantly, all the players to buy into that. Because I, I know if we do, then we'll be very successful and we'll have a lot of fun along the way. So... Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of BRS with Ash Ricky. It was very enriching. I hope you had fun too. It was awesome, mate. Thank you. Thanks, Ricky. Thank you so much.